tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Hospitalizations reach a peak in BC, which means the worst of this COVID wave could be done also. It takes way too long to get to the hospital. Why ambulance wait times in some remote communities are spiking. And how BC families are adapting as the pandemic forces them to keep Lunar New Year celebrations small. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. As Canadian athletes prepare to compete in Beijing, there's a chance they won't have to travel too far for future Olympic competitions. As Renee Filipponi shows us, a bid to bring the Games back to Vancouver for 2030 is moving one step closer to reality. In the final moments before the Beijing Games, Team Canada is fine-tuning its skills. But before competition begins, the Canadian Olympic Committee is planning for the future announcing its support for a potential bid to bring the Games back to Vancouver, just 12 years after the 2010 Olympics. Personally, I'm very optimistic. Wilson Williams is a counselor with the Squamish Nation, one of four First Nations spearheading the push. Right now, they are trying to determine if it's feasible. We'll actually determine the cost itself and whether it's feasible for our community and the host nations if it's viable to move forward. Well, I was a skeptic of the 2010 Olympic Games. Vancouver's mayor says this time it's different, not only because of the indigenous leadership, but also because it would be cheaper than 2010. Well, I, I think there's the, the regular benefit of, of having the attention of the world on you, which is a good thing. Uh, but if we, this could be done without building a single new venue. But some venues will need to be updated and refurbished. It's also unclear where the athletes would stay now that the Olympic Village is condos. I think the IOC would get very excited about a bid that talked about repurposing because that's where their heads are, are at now. Um, and so that, you know, that's not going to be free, but it's not going to be the same as building new again. Vancouverites enjoying the city's unwinter-like weather today had mixed reactions. I think there was a lot of pushback in the 2010 Olympics, but when it came, I think people around here really did enjoy it. I feel like the Olympics end up prioritizing um, kind of a concentration of wealth. Before moving forward, any potential bid would need sign-off from the city, the province, and Ottawa. A decision on whether to put a formal bid before the IOC is expected this fall. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Remote communities in our province are seeing a huge increase in ambulance wait times. The mayor of Bowen Island says in some cases, people have been left hoping for help for eight hours. As John Hernandez reports, it's all because of changes to how paramedics are staffed here in BC. It might be a short boat ride from the lower mainland, but residents of Bowen Island face a much different reality when it comes to emergency health care. It takes way too long. To get to the hospital, we have to go on the ferry. We are depending on the ferry schedule. There is no hospital here, but there are first responders, and historically, they've been on call 24-7. But that's not the case anymore. For November, December, there was probably a half a dozen times when we were without service for eight hours. And we're absolutely shocked. Last year, BC Emergency Health Services moved medics in some remote areas away from on-call in favor of regular part-time schedules. On Bowen, the transition has led to service outages. The island's mayor says some patients have had to wait for ambulances from Lions Bay or even Squamish. We have a big seniors population on the island in the community and, you know, they're at risk and we have some other high-risk people that depend on that ambulance service. Andrew is asking BC's health ministry to reinstate round-the-clock service, an effort that's gained the support of residents. I think it's absolutely necessary. We have no hospital here. We have lots of elderly people and lots of very young children. It's very concerning. Someone could die. I mean, even now with an ambulance, you still have to go on a ferry to get over to the mainland. And 
that's going to make it twice as bad. The paramedics union says there have been similar outages in other remote communities. So I'm very familiar with the situation that's on Bowen and sadly I have to report it's, a, it's not unique. We're seeing it in Queen Charlotte, we're seeing it in, in the Elkford, every corner of this province. BC Emergency Health Services says recruitment challenges and staff unavailability are what's led to gaps. A problem the union says could be solved by adding full-time jobs and better pay. John Hernandez, CBC News, Bowen Island. Turning now to COVID-19, nine more people have died since yesterday, all in the Fraser Health region. Hospitalizations have stayed above 1,000, but are seeing a slight dip. So is that the sign of a peak? As Valpiri reports, health officials seem to think so, indicating that the worst of this wave could be over. It does look like we are at our peak of hospitalizations. If that's the case, it's good news. For the first time during the pandemic, COVID-19 hospitalizations in BC have broken the 1,000 mark. Hospitalizations are what we call a lagging indicator. It takes time and we have had very high levels of transmission in the community for some time now. And we have seen this translate into, um, into hospitalizations most recently. Last week alone, up to January 30th, there were 706 new COVID admissions. Despite that number, the rate of COVID-19 hospitalizations are said to be decreasing across every age group. And this is where we would expect to be, um, given the modeling that we've been using to help, help us understand the trajectory. The vast majority of patients in hospital are testing positive for Omicron. Compared to those with Delta, Omicron patients require approximately half as long as stay. Unvaccinated Omicron patients are still overrepresented, accounting for 26% of hospitalizations between January 14th and the 27th. But it's the so-called incidental cases that have skewed the numbers. Those patients are ones admitted to hospital for non-COVID reasons, but test positive during routine screening. A look at 550 COVID patients since December 1st across BC shows 244 or 44% were admitted for surgery or to give birth or for mental health issues. And of those... And we can see that about 60% of admissions that were related to uh, um, Omicron uh, were not because of the infection, but people who were admitted and tested and found to have a positive test. The data also shows people are not getting as sick now as they were with previous variants. Of the 306 who were actually admitted for COVID, 88 or only 16% needed critical care. The other 218 did not. BC has also seen an increase in serious COVID illness among people over 80. That's likely because many have underlying conditions that could send them to hospital where they are tested for COVID. There are over a thousand people um, and there will be today in hospital with COVID. There's still a very significant number, although less relatively speaking compared to the total number than before in our intensive care units. Health officials still promise a review of restrictions in a couple of weeks with hopes that some can be lifted by the end of the month. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. Several faculty and staff at SFU want to know how and why their names were added to an online petition against a return to in-class learning. The university confirms a number of professors and staff noticed their signatures were listed when they had not signed it. The petition coincided with a walkout in late January at the Burnaby Mountain campus protesting the decision to resume in-person learning. The head of the SFU Student Society says it wasn't involved with creating the petition. Well, staff at St. Paul's Hospital have found a new way to help lower the number of people being killed by the toxic drug crisis. As Joel Ballard reports, the in-house overdose prevention site has already helped save almost 100 lives in just one year. Inside the walls of St. Paul's Hospital, staff launched Canada's very first in-house overdose prevention site. It celebrated its one-year anniversary on Tuesday. We don't condemn or condone substance use, but um, what we recognize is people may continue to use while they're in hospital. The site gives them a safe space to do that, with clean equipment under the supervision of nurses. Over the last year, more than 2,300 patients have visited the site. 90 overdoses were reversed. Prevent people from overdosing in stairwells, in washrooms, on their own. 
uh, prevent them from rushing to inject and maybe, you know, creating some type of infection. If a patient overdoses, nurses are on hand to intervene. Among the staff is Karen Scott, a crucial member of the team. I usually connect with 10 to 15 patients daily. And also, if people don't know about the overdose prevention site, I bring them down here, escort them. I can wait around for them until they're done and then take them back to their unit. Because of her lived experience as a drug user, Scott says she's able to help patients push through the stigma. Probably because they've had bad dealings with people in the hospital, judging them because they are injecting drugs. 2021 proved to be the deadliest year for toxic drug overdoses in BC, with more than 1,700 deaths in the first 10 months alone. It's getting worse um, because of the drug contamination is getting worse. The Overdose Prevention Society runs three sites in Vancouver, and while it helps keep people alive, Blythe says bold action from politicians is what's really needed to turn the dial. We're still losing so many people, it's, it's just a tragedy. And really all we need is um, safe supply. Back at St. Paul's, staff keep the site clean, ready for the next patient. It's a big accomplishment for me. I never thought I'd get a job, let alone be in a medical field where I'm actually helping people that I used to want shoes with. Moving forward, Scott would like to see hospitals across Canada implement their own overdose prevention sites. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. A salmon armed man charged with sexual interference and assault against a minor is on the run, and he has illegally taken his two daughters with him. RCMP are asking for the public's, health, public's help in locating 40-year-old Caleb Gerbrandt and his two daughters, 14-year-old Aaliyah and 13-year-old Avery. They're believed to be in the Lower Mainland or Vancouver Island area. Police say Gerbrandt is evading them after violating his curfew. Aaliyah and Avery were supposed to be staying at their grandmother's house. Gerbrandt was driving a 2006 Grey Dodge Grand Caravan. It bears the license plate NE. N961N. And renewed calls tonight for hunters to stop using lead ammunition after a number of bald eagles and red tail hawks died from lead poisoning. A wildlife rehab society in Delta says eight raptors were brought in last month. They were able to treat this bald eagle and a hawk, but the others didn't make it. The birds ingest lead fragments by scavenging the remains of animals left in the outdoors by hunters. It becomes a major threat to wildlife and the society says many more deaths are expected. We're going to get more. This is just a drop in the bucket. Um, we'll, another month of this, month, month and a half, uh, we'll probably receive more. Again, every year is different. Every day is different. We just don't know. Hope is urging hunters to use copper and polymer ammunition instead. The Canadian government banned lead for hunting waterfowl 20 years ago. The two surviving birds will eventually be returned to the wild. And BC's controversial wolf cull will continue for another five years. Known as the Aerial Wolf Reduction Program, the cull was put in place in 2015 to prevent the further decline of caribou populations. It involves the shooting of wolves from a helicopter. Some animal rights groups and conservationists criticize the program, while others support it. The province believes it's the most effective and humane way to reduce wolf populations in remote areas. The renewed program will target several locations, including the Kootenai, Caribou and Peace regions. Researchers are stumped after a Canada goose from B.C. was found almost 3,000 kilometers away in Chicago. Vancouver Island University researchers tagged 400 birds in an Nanaimo project and a website was set up for the public to report sightings. These geese mostly stay in Vancouver and around 15 percent travel as far as Washington or Oregon. But in October, researchers got a report that their bird had been spotted in the Windy City by a jogger who made out the digits on its collar and reported it to their website. I mean, if I were a goose, maybe I'd try to avoid this incoming snow as well. But uh, I feel like the Chicago weather, not not sure that's much better. Yes, uh, take it from me. I think uh, Vancouver's couple centimeters, probably better than Chicago's minus 30 wind chills right now oh. for any other geese thinking of making the move. Yeah, we are watching incoming snow for Metro Vancouver. Special weather statement in place. But let me start you off with the temperatures because that's 
one half of the equation that will get us to the snow tomorrow. Two right now at YVR. Temperatures tonight are going to be dropping down uh, below the freezing mark by a couple of degrees. We've actually got a modified Arctic air mass making its way down across uh, BC right now. And that colliding with a Pacific system will mean snow for a huge swath of the province. Prince George, Quinell, Caribou uh, looking to see 20 plus centimeters of snow and all of the white from the Sunshine Coast through Eastern Vancouver Island, Greater Victoria area and Metro Vancouver, mainly the North Shore, Burnaby, Tri-Cities and then out towards the Valley, uh, two to five centimeters. Yeah, I know it's not a lot of snow. So that's why we don't have the snowfall warnings in place. Uh, and it's going to change over to rain through the day tomorrow. Uh, as for timing, as far as when it starts, around 8 a.m. for Metro Vancouver. Uh, so if you can get out early, you might avoid the piling up snow, but be prepared for delays in the morning. I'll take you through the warm up and change over to rain. We're not done with winter yet, though, Anita. Okay, it's coming though. I think we're almost it's done. It's coming. Although I like both, yeah. so yeah. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> Spring Thanks. is in the distance. I'll see if I can get us there later. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by Sophia Financial Group of Raymond James Limited. Register now for our free cash flow connection series at sophiaevents.ca. Well, Premier John Horgan in good spirits today, making his first appearance since finishing treatments for throat cancer. He used the occasion to celebrate Lunar New Year. We're hoping for strength and prosperity for not just uh, uh, British Columbia, but for all Canadians. Uh, we've been through a hell of a time over the past two years. I know everyone wants to put that behind us. And what a better way to start the year of the tiger. But looking forward with a positive outlook. Horgan says he's lost 25 pounds since his diagnosis. But he told reporters he's feeling pretty good. Uh, the hair stopped growing uh, in various parts on my face. Uh, and so I kept the mustache as uh, good battlers that decided to stick around. But uh, uh, the radiation uh, from the from about here down uh, eliminated the need to shave, so I'm pretty happy about that. The Premier thanking all the medical staff that cared for him since his diagnosis in November. He plans on being back in the legislature for the speech from the throne next week. And for another year, Lunar New Year is looking very different for most families today in B.C. Many are being forced to keep it small. That said, we're going to check in with our Leanne Young, who is celebrating with her family tonight. Leanne, what's happening in your home? Well, Anita, I would say it's looking uh, very intimate over here. So uh, I brought you here to my home. Normally, we would probably be out and about around this time of year, live at celebrations, perhaps at Aberdeen Mall or in Chinatown. But no, no such thing happening this year. All the celebrations we're seeing either canceled or have gone virtual. And everybody uh, really just at home for the most part. There are a couple of people, of course, still celebrating at restaurants. But even then, we are under restrictions. So we're looking at maximum six people at the table. So I think a lot of people are at home like we are tonight. And you you can see uh, my stepdad's here, my mom, my son, Preston, and my husband. Um, and we're gathered in front of our uh, Lunar New Year feast. We've got a couple of interesting things on the table. Um, of course, this festival is all about family and connection and, uh, and tradition and history. And a big part of it is the way we greet each other as soon as we see each other for Lunar New Year's Day. So, I mean, because I'm Chinese, I would call it Chinese New Year. So um, as soon as we arrived in the house today, saw my mom and dad, and I said, a number of different greetings to them. And I wanted to uh, introduce our audience to some of the different ways you can say Happy New Year. Uh, we hear Gong Hei Fat Choi a lot, but it's not always the best way to say it. So um, take a look at um, uh, some uh, information I had put together a couple of years ago um, talking just about that. Gong Hei Fat Choi. Gong Hei Fat Choi. Gong Hei Fat Choi. You hear it everywhere this time of year, congratulating or wishing someone wealth and prosperity. But there are a couple of things to know about the common greeting. Gong Hei Fa Chai or Gong Xi Fa Chai is Chinese, and it's not just the Chinese who celebrate Lunar New Year. Many Asian cultures do, like Koreans and Vietnamese. And then there's the fact that Gong Hei Fa Chai is Cantonese. Many of us uh, brand China as this one monolithic entity, but it has taken so many different forms throughout history. And the diaspora is vastly different. Some of us speak Cantonese, others Mandarin, others maybe Hokkien. 
If you're able, find out, because it's a sign of respect that you know uh, what language and you want to communicate and express your blessings and well wishes with them in the proper uh, dialect. And there are a multitude of greetings worthy of the red and gold. Chinese New Year greetings are like poetry, typically always in four characters, like gu cheng yu yi, meaning good luck and happiness. Or there's m fuk lam mun, wishing you five blessings for a wealthy, healthy, and virtuous long life. Or you could just say happy new year. That's sunlin fai lok in Cantonese, or xing yan kuai le in Mandarin. You can also do it in English, just because it's, uh, if pronunciation might be an, uh, an issue for you, say it in English. Or even in French. Bonne année du rat, san nin fai lo. San nin fai lo, man si yi, san tai gin hong, li nin yao yu. Xin nin kuai le, wan si ru yi. So san lin fai lo to everyone. So aside from the language, a big part of the culture is the food. And I wanted to introduce you to a little bit of what we've got on the table. So we're having fish this year. We have fish every year. Fish is a big part of it because in Chinese, yu means, uh, it, sounds like, it sounds like abundance. So homonyms are a big part of it. We also have my mom's spare ribs. They're called gum sa guat. So it sounds kind of like money. So we always have them on the table. And the, this dish here, very important. That guy uh, picked up from my uh, local Chinese restaurant, Sun Soi Wa there. Uh, that one is called Poon Choi, and it's just got layers and layers of goodness inside there. So um, that one we will be enjoying, and that's probably the delicacy for this year as we celebrate inside all of our homes. Anita? Well, it all looks absolutely delicious, Leanne. Thanks for inviting us inside your home, and hope you have a wonderful evening, all of you. Thank you. And out of the 12 animals featured on the Chinese zodiac, the tiger is considered one of the most powerful because it represents vitality, bravery, and resilience. And after two years riddled with pandemic hardships and anti-Asian hate, Asian community leaders are looking to the tiger's strength to build the community. How do we move forward uh, with the level of not only mutual respect, but an understanding that we are uh, a part of you know, Canada, uh, as much as every other multicultural community is. And I think in the year of the tiger, I think what we want to do is to further demonstrate that courage, not only to be seen as part of the community, but to speak up. And, and then for the past two years, all the bad things, all the evil spirits, you know, uh, bad things happen, divide the society. I think that we even become more stronger to unite together. Each animal in the Chinese zodiac cycles through five elements, and this year belongs to the water tiger. Water is unpredictable, so we're advised to keep an open mind. Let's hope this one brings us good luck. Showdown in Alberta. A border protest faces RCMP action as tensions rise. We'll take you there next. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. There are many creative ways to ring in the year of the tiger. In Quebec, an artist has carved snow sculptures on his front lawn in honor of the festivities. As the CBC's Rowan Kennedy reports, his icy creations have become a must see neighborhood attraction. Kind of prod. Xin Wan is visiting from Toronto for Chinese New Year. She decided to celebrate by visiting this Kirkland home she had heard about on social media. This beautiful sculptures and it's uh, kind of very special for New Year. Sweeping across Xu Fangzhang's lawn are ten sculptures made of snow. Lions to stand guard and protect the family's home, a dragon and a tiger, the sign of the incoming Lunar New Year. This work is not, not, uh, not easy, it's very hard. A painter and a calligrapher by trade, Zhang started carving snow sculptures during the pandemic. <laughs> Now, every single day, he can be seen on his lawn, scraping away. On sunny days like this, he says it's delicate work. I have to repair it every day. <laughs> the snow sculpture, uh, it's very interesting. The snow sculpture is changing every day. So the beautiful is different. Every day is different. And now he's getting new opportunities to create his sculptures. On Sunday, Zhang spent all day carving this piece outside of a senior's residence. Many people have seen my snow sculpture. They put smiles on their face. I'm very happy. There's a tiger over there. That's super cool. Like, I really don't understand how long it must have taken them to do that. It's incredible. And the Komodo dragon with so much detail, which is what I find really, really great. Beautiful, you know. And I thought, oh, I, I have to tell my husband to come see. And I'm going to want to get my kid to come look also. <laughs> and we want the kids sort of get a, 
you know, they don't, they don't forget Chinese traditional cultures, even when they're in Canada. Jin Wan says the makeshift exhibit helps residents in the area understand Chinese culture so they can all celebrate the new year together. Rowan Kennedy, CBC News, Kirkland. As demonstrators hold their ground in Ottawa, a sympathy protest is blocking a key Canada-U.S. border crossing in southern Alberta. Protesters shut down the Coutts border crossing on the weekend, cutting off the village of Coutts and blocking vital goods. As the CBC's Aaron Collins shows us, they're calling for an end to mandatory vaccinations for all truckers entering Canada, like their counterparts in Ottawa. Here since Saturday, determined to stay much longer. This blockade has been disrupting traffic and trade for days. Protesters here focused on overturning vaccine and mask mandates in Alberta. God gives us freedom, not the government. So we don't need to ask the government for freedom to walk around our country. There is support for the ideas behind this blockade in this part of Alberta, but it has its limits. Cutting off uh, my freedom of movement and that of uh, my citizens here, uh, it becomes something that I can't approve of. Mounties have been trying to convince these protesters to leave peacefully. Now their strategy has shifted. Officers moved in in force to ask the protesters to leave one final time before forcing them out. And then we received notification that uh, additional protesters were arriving on the scene, came around our secure area. So. Initially, some success, but as some trucks drove off, even more drove in, breaching the RCMP barricade and setting back plans to clear this road. It's a win for these protesters, but at what cost? Their blockade intact, but the tactics used to keep it bleeding support even among political allies. And I call for calm amongst anybody who feels sympathetic uh, to those engaged in this blockade. Please uh, stay away from the area. Uh, please do not uh, further intensify an, an already difficult situation. But those supporters have their own message for the Premier. The Premier could end it right now. Simply open up Alberta. He is responsible as well as Justin Trudeau, not these people. That's Aaron Collins reporting tonight. The anti-mandate protest is now into its fifth day in downtown Ottawa, with many wondering how or when it might end. Federal Minister Marco Mendicino says there's been a coordinated effort to ensure public safety as the truck convoy and protesters remain near Parliament Hill. But he spoke about the frustration many city residents have been expressing. Understanding that there is a right to demonstrate and to express a certain point of view uh, is one thing, but uh, but where there are, you know are unacceptable incidents and uh, you know confrontation, etc., uh, those decisions do need to be taken independently by police officers. Mendicino says the RCMP, Parliament, Security and other partners are in constant contact with Ottawa Police Service, but the matter falls under the city's jurisdiction. 
While the din from honking trucks continues, the crowd has thinned significantly from the 8,000 or more protesters reported on Saturday. Some say they won't leave until they can force the federal government to repeal all public health measures. Most of the COVID-19 mandates, including masking, have been put in place, though, by provincial governments. Federal Conservative Party leader Aaron O'Toole is in danger of losing his job. A caucus revolt is underway to try to oust him as leader after a group of MPs triggered a leadership vote. But as Hannah Thibodeau reports, O'Toole says he's not going down without a fight. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I stand in this House. This may have been the last time Aaron O'Toole stood in the House of Commons as the leader of the Conservatives. Ally of Canada. Last night, while he was delivering a speech on Ukraine, a letter signed by 35 MPs from his own Tory caucus was being delivered, which could spark the end of O'Toole's leadership. MPs will cast a secret ballot Wednesday morning. If 60 of them, more than half of the caucus, vote in favour, O'Toole will be out. Late last night, he released this statement, saying, I'm not going anywhere. It is time for a reckoning to settle this in caucus right here, right now. Today, reaction was mixed. I'm supporting Aaron O'Toole. What are you making with I think we need uh, new, strong, principled leadership. Uh, that, uh, that will allow our caucus uh, to move together, united, going forward. Does he deserve to stay? Yes. Why? Why? So Why? Why not? Okay. What, do you, what, do you, what do you make of what's Just happening? because you've got a bunch of angry Shearites out there, that's the problem. I think that perhaps that's the leader has some thinking to do. O'Toole has faced grumbling over his leadership since losing the election. Many say he wasn't authentic or consistent on his messaging, from banning assault weapons to the carbon tax. Some saying he managed to alienate every wing of the party. So if Mr. O'Toole loses, the rule says he has to go. Uh, but if he wins, then he's got a lot of uh, fence mending and, and, uh, and bridge building to do. So this isn't going away anytime soon. O'Toole was a no-show at question period today. Sources tell CBC News he and his team are working the phones to ensure he survives tomorrow's vote. But the anti-O'Toole MPs are also organizing behind the scenes today to ensure they have enough votes to get him out. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. You're worn down, your health is suffering, and you visit the doctor. Coming up, why you may get a prescription for the park. It's the climax of the Chinese New Year here in Vancouver. Lions, drums, cymbals. So in the middle of this Chinese celebration, what's this group doing here? Kids all the way from the Mount Curry Indian Reserve near Whistler. It's all part of a unique exchange launched by one man 10 years ago to bring the Chinese and First Nations communities together on what he calls the road to reconciliation. Bill Chu is the tour guide on a journey that began in 1990 after he was disturbed by the conflict between soldiers and native protesters at Oka. It's a situation that we did not expect to see in Canada, meaning that in a country that prides itself on uh, human rights and so forth. So the engineer went to Mount Curry, a community in the middle of a logging dispute. He planted a tree, hoping to heal the misunderstandings. Now, a decade later, he takes groups of Chinese Canadians to Mount Curry every year to show them what life is like on a reserve. The visitors are honoured with a welcome song hosted by Chu's friend, Elvin Nelson. He doesn't try to change our, our um, opinion about anything. He, he's just uh, basically tried to educate his people that, uh, that we're, we're not, uh, you know, we're not heathens. Eh? Then inside for a feast, 
and for many here, it's all an eye-opener. I have a different view, whole different view of what native is. Like, it's, before, in my definition, different native is just um, people that in downtown that are all drunk and stuff. And that tree, the one Chu planted in Elvin Nelson's yard 10 years ago, it's now over 10 feet tall. Uh, it symbolizes the potential for coming together again of two neighbors. To the Chinese, the new year is a time to start afresh. These two friends hope their efforts show a new way for all Canadians to walk together. Duncan McHugh, CBC News, Vancouver. This is the beginning of the year 4677 in the Chinese calendar. Depending on who you talk to, it's either the year of the ram or the goat. And Vancouver's Chinese community really celebrated it this afternoon. The three classic blocks of Pender Street were jammed with people. The police estimated the size of the crowd at 15,000. Some observers put it in the 20 to 30,000 range. Our camera crew found that there was barely room for the colorful parade to make it down the street. This year's dragon was upwards of 100 feet long. Again, it was so eager to get a look at it that it barely made the journey down Pender. There were as many people of other racial origins as Chinese in the crowd. Because of the fine weather, everybody was equipped with cameras. Girls from several Chinese dance organizations have spoken out that put on small demonstrations of their art. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It's very concerning. Someone could die. I mean, even now with an ambulance, you still have to go on a ferry to get over to the mainland, and that's going to make it twice as bad. Remote communities in our province are seeing a huge increase in ambulance wait times. On Bowen Island, in some cases, people have been left hoping for help for eight hours. It's because of a change to how paramedics are staffed in B.C., and now many are demanding the province revert back to the old system. BC's controversial wolf call will continue for another five years. The call was put in place in 2015 to prevent the decline of caribou populations. It involves shooting wolves from a helicopter. Some animal rights groups and conservationists have slammed the program, while others support it. The province believes it's the most effective and humane way to reduce wolf populations in remote areas. Our province appears to have reached a peak number in terms of patients in hospital with COVID-19, and a review of recent cases shows the risk of hospitalization has been cut in half during the Omicron wave. Well, this year we are, this week rather, we are running a three-part CBC Creator Network series called The Opposite of Isolated. It follows Vancouver filmmaker Julian Baisa as he builds connections in a city made lonelier by the pandemic. In today's episode, Baisa strikes up conversations with strangers he met at the tennis court. This started as a post-lockdown project. Each week I'd pick a new spot and spend the day there with my camera, talking to strangers. Every place has a different personality. The skate park was intimidating at first until I spoke to the skaters. There's a hidden beauty behind this chaos. What is it about skateboarding that brings people together? When I skateboard, it makes me feel weightless, where I'm moving my body and like wind is blowing through my hair and like sun is on my skin and I feel really content. When I was 19, turning 20, I was in a treatment center for anorexia and I was really, really sick. Like, my heart almost stopped, I was really underweight. And I remember, like, changing into the, the hospital gown and I felt like no one on earth could possibly understand the amount of guilt and shame that I felt for being sick. I definitely hit sort of a bottom where I was like really underweight, partying a lot, just hated my life. I think I would have died if I didn't get sober. So I've been sober for 15 months and it's been a trip being sober. <laughs> 
My name is Daisy. I'm 23 and um, don't always love who I am all the time, but I don't hate it either. And that's progress for me. Right now the bar is literally just do I exist here. My name's Anahid, or I go by Nana. I'm a writer, I rock climb, and in February I started skateboarding. I realized pretty young that I'm kind of a compulsive liar, so I should probably just channel that into writing fiction. I was in the closet. I just got really good at it as a means of survival. And I identify as trans and non-binary, and I have long hair, so people assume I'm a girl. So navigating a double life for like moving between realities and trying to keeping like trying to keep the balance. Like I don't necessarily just want to skateboard to like be good at it. I feel like having the time in my life to like consistently work at something and like enjoy progressing at it and feel connected and entitled to it to me is like a huge privilege that it's been a challenge these last few years especially to like be here. I've got several people I've made connection with here. One of them is Nathan. He goes up the ramp and goes across on the wall for <laughs> goes down the next ramp so he, he's quite impressive. You know, maybe not everybody is doing as much as they could, but you got to respect, well, that's, that's where they're at, and everybody is working to improve themselves, to develop their, you know, their whole being. The best thing is to just have conversations. You know, that's the way that we get to know each other and to be part of each other in a certain way. Right? I still don't really know what I'm looking for. Community. Belonging. After these last few years, I'm just grateful to be outside, talking with people in the park. Darn. And we have a groundbreaking tool tonight to tell you about for BC doctors and their patients with mental health challenges. Physicians can now prescribe a free pass to Canada's national parks. The move is aimed at improving anxiety and mental and physical health by simply being out in nature. There are 80 national parks to access, and UBC has opened up its botanical and Japanese gardens to those with a prescription. The timing couldn't be better, as the pandemic and climate change create growing cases of anxiety and depression. Joining me now is Dr. Melissa Lem, a family physician and the director of the Parks Program. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Dr. Lem, this is such a great idea. How did this come about? Well, about a year ago, the BC Parks Foundation and, and the Park Prescription Program, PARX, started speaking with Parks Canada about how we might be able to collaborate to reduce barriers to access to nature for Canadians. And here we are a year later. Now our Nature Prescription Program, which launched about a year ago, um, a year later now we can prescribe Parks Canada passes to our patients to reduce those barriers to nature access. So how does it all work and who exactly can get a prescription? Right, well, any licensed healthcare provider within Canada, within the provinces where we've launched, so that includes BC, Ontario, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, can prescribe one um, free Parks Canada Discovery Pass per month to their patients. So we're really asking them to prioritize patients who, for example, live close to Parks Canada sites, so they'll have more access and can make it part of their everyday lives, and also those for whom the cost of a pass might be a barrier to nature access. And what role has the pandemic and, and even the effects of climate change played in all of this? I think one silver lining of the pandemic has been that people have discovered and rediscovered how important nature is to them. There are a number of surveys that have come out during the pandemic that have said that people have really appreciated nature time for their mental health and really sought it out to deal with the stress that COVID-19 has caused. And then in terms of climate change, I mean, I think in BC, we saw over the past half year with the heat dome and then the wildfires and the flooding, we're really realizing how important safe healthy natural spaces are to us as people who live in British Columbia. So I think, again, rediscovering nature and then realizing how nature is, imp how important it is to us has really underlined that nature health connection for us and for many people in BC. Absolutely. Dr. Melissa Lem, thank you. You're welcome. 
Black History Month kicks off today. Why this year's theme is allyship and leadership. That's next. And at 643, a live look at the Port of Vancouver tonight. Snow is coming. The wintry mix ahead. Johanna has all the details after the break. An international team of scientists is taking to coastal waters to understand how climate change is impacting Pacific salmon and what they find could have big implications for many BC communities. 60 researchers are setting out on four ships from Canada, the U.S. and Russia. The $10 million project is set to take two months. Their goal is to do a complete survey of North Pacific salmon habitat from the BC coast to the length of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. This will allow us to learn um, which areas in the ocean, in space and time are important to particular species and be able to understand how a changing climate and a changing ocean uh, can will be affecting fish now and potentially into the future. As Salmon fishing has been severely restricted in BC and the Yukon. Researchers believe some of these sensitive populations will not survive a warming climate.
Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is here now. And Joe, I'm sure everybody's getting ready for that snowfall for tomorrow. But uh, what's happening after that? Are we getting a little bit of something different? Yes, you're right, Anita. And I'm, I'm glad we're starting with that because the snow we get tomorrow, not going to stick around for the second half of the week. Temperatures will be warming. We'll get back to the rain. This is really a midweek blip. Let me take you to the current wind chills across the country to start with because we're starting to see some of that Arctic air descend down across British Columbia, feeling like minus seven right now in Triclona. Your temperatures have been dropping steadily through the day as you get to that boundary, feeling like minus 36 and through Regina. Regina, uh, full on blizzard conditions for a full day. This is the longest blizzard Winnipeg has ever dealt with. Finally seen uh, winds ease tonight since 1997. Nine hours of visibility, less than 400 meters. So a lot of winter going on across Canada. That's headed to Toronto tomorrow for 20 centimeters, by the way. Uh, now let's get through our two to five centimeters. I'm going to pause you around 8, 9 a.m. That's when I think the snow will fill in for Metro Vancouver. And you can see here, uh, we've got those outflow winds. The winds come, going from the east to the west. That's bringing the cold air out towards the coast, colliding with the Pacific system. So everyone getting the snow to start. As we work through the day, notice that pink line starts to retreat back up to Metro Vancouver. So I think through the afternoon, we'll start to see some mixing and then overnight changing over to rain. So we'll be left with snow totals that look something like this. The white, that's just trace amount. So down towards Richmond, uh, Delta, White Rock, maybe just trace back up to uh, much of Metro Vancouver, uh, two to five centimeters. Some areas may see five to seven, but this isn't a huge event by any means, just a messy one anytime, of course, we get a couple centimeters of snow. And we're talking more like 20 centimeters for Prince George. You can see the blue there through the day. We're going to continue to get that mild Pacific air, though, filtering in. So everyone's seeing that change over to warmer temperatures for Thursday, Friday. So that's a snow rain icon for Wednesday. But look at that. Full on rain for Thursday and Friday. It looks fairly steady, but not necessarily heavy for Thursday. We might get one burst of heavy rain through the first half of Friday. Might even see some sun for the second half. Uh, manage to protect our weekend. Still looking good with a mix of sun and cloud. Anita, we're starting to see those temperatures warm up as our days get longer. I'll leave on that positive note. I love it. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by Sophia Financial Group of Raymond James Limited. Register now for our free cash flow connection series at sophiaevents.ca. <laughs> Today marks the start of Black History Month in Canada. This year's theme is allyship and leadership. And as Natalie Collada reports, it comes at a time when many say it's very much needed. It marks the start of Toronto District School Board's African Heritage Month virtual celebration. Here at the TDSB, we have more than 30,000 students in our classrooms that identify as Black. African Heritage Month is a chance to ensure that their identities are represented, respected, and understood. And advocates say it's very much needed. This weekend, Nazi symbols, anti-Semitic and racist imagery were displayed at protests in Ottawa. It's shocking to see that people are shocked at the level of hate and this um, display of hate we're seeing today. I think it's important for Torontarians to ask themselves, why are we celebrating Black History Month? And what can I do to be part of the conversation? Including more members of the Black community in leadership positions and celebrating Black flourishment and achievement. If you see yourself and you could say, that can be me. And why do I know that's possible? Because in my organization, I see at the executive table I see people in the C-suite who look like me, so therefore, I feel I can work towards that. The Indie Mindy clothing brand began after Deborah Vassell went to buy pajamas for her nieces and found none were representative. It would be nice to do things that are inspirational, so the careers that children would like to do, or just to let them know as an option. So the first uh, pajama character that we had designed was actually the doctor pajamas. And then we have the baker pajamas, a chef, musician, just, and we have more coming soon as well. Professions that 
you know, black children can look up to because it's so important for them to see representations of themselves. In art too, on Thursday, the Art Gallery of Ontario is running a virtual program for students across the GTA, part of a larger year long program. It gives you a better understanding of why the artists might have created what they created, what are some of the things that went into the artwork and how to really read the work itself. <laughs> All of it learning, advocates say, should continue beyond February. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. Bringing in some light amidst the darkness, how the town of New Denver in BC is lighting up the city streets next. A peek inside the equipment depot at Saw Video in the Arts Court, where budding filmmakers can find everything they need, cameras, lighting and sound gear. Director Annette Hegel says the tradition of being a lending library for visual storytellers will continue. But after four decades, it's time to look to the future with a name change. Saw Video is now known as DARC, which stands for Digital Arts Resource Centre. When we decided to go from SAW, which is, stands for Sussex Annex Works, which describes the space that we used to be in a long, long time ago in the market, to um, just be very simple and straightforward and call ourselves the Digital Arts Resource Centre because that's what we are. And if you look around and behind me, we have the resources for all the digital arts. Dark is marking its 40th anniversary with screenings of a series of international films from acclaimed digital artists. The Black Case is a gothic horror retelling a tragic night in a Canadian residential school. It's from Indigenous multimedia artist Caroline Monet, who grew up in Elmer, Quebec. I wanted to raise awareness around Indigenous issues. I mean, growing up, uh, being Indigenous was not something we were necessarily proud of uh, within my family. It was not something that was necessarily celebrated. Uh, and, and I feel through art, I was able to change that. I felt like through art, I was able to kind of break that cycle of victimization. I was able to, you know, find a voice and, and not and feel proud about where I'm from. During the shutdowns, Dark arranged for curbside pickup of equipment. This week, it will welcome back members who can make use of studios and screening rooms. And coming in the spring, the chance to shoot scenes in a brand new, fully equipped sound stage that's being fitted out at the University of Ottawa. So there is going to be a 6,000 square foot sound stage with like 18 foot ceiling, um, full LED lighting grid and uh, cinematic camera equipment. Indie filmmakers will be having their own studio available downtown and it's a five minute, less than five minute walk from here so all the equipment can be hauled over. Dark, the Digital Arts Resource Centre will be celebrating 40 years of nurturing Ottawa's filmmaking community beginning on February the 15th at Arts Court. Sandra Abma, CBC News, Ottawa. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Get Metro Vancouver news that matters to you all in one place as it happens wherever you are with the free CBC News app. It's easy to use. Open the app and set your local tab to BC for news that's curated to you. And you can even watch live streams of CBC Vancouver News at 6 with Anita Bath and other CBC News broadcasts on the go. Download the free CBC News app and stay connected to where you live. 
bright lights in dark times. The village of New Denver in the Kootenays put on a festival last night to bring the community together. The Spark in the Dark Lantern Festival featured live music and a parade of homemade lanterns. Brendan Coulter is the CBC's pop-up bureau reporter for Castlegar and brings us the sights and sounds from this new festival. A chilly night did not stop people from enjoying the Spark in the Dark Lantern Festival here in downtown New Denver. More than 100 people came together for a celebration of light and joy in the middle of winter. Several organizers and attendees say that COVID-19 has divided people in the community, but this festival is helping to bring them together. Festival goers enjoyed live music and paraded through town showing off homemade lanterns, some of which took months to build. Gathered some twigs from outside and started bending them into shapes and taping them. And, and then I began to assemble and it took on this funny flower shape. <laughs> Everyone I spoke to says that the festival is a welcome break from the stresses of everyday life. The founder agrees. In the middle of the winter, news is all bad. We tried to think of something that would bring the community together, something that everybody could participate in with COVID, etc. Just something fun and bright and lanterns are bright. And people here are already buzzing about the kinds of lanterns that they're going to make next year. Brendan Coulter, CBC News, New Denver. Definitely some light in the darkness. And with all that snow, so absolutely beautiful. Thank you for watching CBC Vancouver News tonight. And if you are celebrating Lunar New Year, hope you're enjoying your wonderful meals. Good night.